all these years we've been doing panels here, and I never realized that the clock for the panel starts before we start walking on. Memo to self, start walking faster. Thank you all for being here with us on what is the first of its kind of this particular panel, The Future of Value. Now, I see some familiar faces in the room, and you were here with us yesterday when we had the last ever Future of Money. For those who are new and going, what's the difference? There is a long-standing tradition here at Cybos. We have long had a debate that we call the future of money. And indulge me here for a second. When we first started the future of money debate, we thought that the biggest and hardest question we were going to answer was how banks are going to deal with startups. Collaboration, competition, adoption. With every passing year, the Swift guys decided to hold us accountable to the fact that we were not quite done. We were getting together to have the same conversation because it wasn't finished. It's been almost 10 years of coming together and talking about the future of money. In that time, we realized that competition and competition and cooperation with the startups was the least of our worries. In these times, we've talked about technology adoption, we've talked about AI, we've talked about DLT, most recently, we talked about CBDCs. And this year, we looked back to see how much we got right in our predictions. A lot, actually. It would have been very embarrassing for some of us if not. And how much we got wrong? Also a lot. And what we got wrong wasn't so much the predictions, but the size of the problem. We were coming to the conversation with a sense of accountability that we have to keep pushing the dialogue forward for everyone in the room. But it took us 10 years to realize that even though we were doing that in good faith, the dialogue we were having was too narrow. So yesterday, we kissed the future of money goodbye. We had the last ever future of money conversation. And today, a new day, I am joined on this panel by three very interesting people with very different trajectories to start a dialogue that we hope will also last 10 years on the future of value. So the first thing I would like to do is unpack how this is different. Because in so many ways, everyone in these halls, everyone in these rooms deals with value, actually. Very few of us deal directly with money. The forms of exchange are more complicated than that. So, um, Jim, I'm going to come to you first. When you were invited to participate to a future of value debate, what was the thing that made you go, that's a good conversation to have? Uh, great question. I, I met with Innes in just a casual conversation. He was talking about a major change that was going to happen at Cybos. And he says, we're, as you mentioned, going to be kicking out the future of money and introducing the future of value, which immediately resonated, had my mind going crazy. And, and it really was a, a, a realization that we're all kind of feeling in our, in our personal lives and our business lives that it's not just the transactional part of the engagement that we have in life, in business, anywhere else. It goes deeper. It takes into account, you know, my value for time, my value for my identity and security, my value for empathy. You know, it, everybody judges this differently, but at the end of the day, it's not just the monetary exchange that we're interested in. It's what else does it do and why do we pick one solution or another, one, one company that we work with another? Why do people pay for the ability to use Amazon to shop? And it goes well beyond simply the cost of the goods sold. It goes into how you feel at the end of the day and being fearful of letting go of that relationship. So it, it's a great place to jump off. We're already down that path, which is kind of interesting because we're, we're introducing future of value at a time when many organizations are already going down that path, making it simpler, making it easier, remembering the importance of sustainability, all these elements that go into the overall value proposition in daily life. I'm sure that the people in the audience go, the nice man with the red shoes talks sense, but I work in correspondent banking, and I'm going to go back to my office on Monday to an inbox that is groaning with emails that I haven't looked at. What about this debate do I take with me? So, Gela, can you break it down to us in a way that can be useful to someone who has a job to do on Monday? I don't get paid enough for this, is what I have to say. <laughs> Think of the value. 
<laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> no. So interestingly enough, we have made very tangible things, fiduciary instruments that we have to protect, that we have to move, which are just representations of permission and access. And now we're being asked to start to be really esoteric about how we start to look at that, what we can actually assign value to move and exchange. The primary thing is, how do I fundamentally build an infrastructure that allows me to adapt to new concepts that can be unitized and commercialized? And it's no longer just a thing or a resource. It could be complex ideas. So we're moving away from this thing called money into this thing called concept. And I want to exchange concept because at the root of the concept, there is value and there is a market for it. So how do I allow the movement of that value of concept to actually be its own marketplace? So part of it's a very practical, how do I face into this? Understanding that the technological infrastructure that I build will enable everything going forward. But what I have built today is fit for purpose for money and for that unit of calculation but now I have to reimagine that I can unitize anything under the sun. And can I future-proof this? Also, how do I do this in a way that is value-oriented around certain principles, be it privacy, data control, consent management, at speed and scale, because there is value in time in addition to the thing or the concept that's being traded. So how do I start to look at mobility of concept, not just mobility of things? And how do I de-risk this? So there's a number of assumptions that we have around money. And it was Monday morning, I would sit down and work with the team to identify what value, how you define value, and then how you actually assume rules around that that have been implemented early to enable this particular system but I would challenge each and every single one of the assumptions that we have around that, because it is no longer just about that. It is about the flexibility and adaptation of the assumptions that underpin the systems that we build. I want to pick on, on, on what, you, what you said there and say that ultimately the infrastructure we've built today is fit for a particular type of value exchange. But it's also fair to say, and I'm, I'm turning to you, Sergey, as someone who lives and breathes this, that over the last few years, we have actually built quite a different infrastructure. And a few years back, it felt like a frontier too far. Today, I would bet that everyone in the audience understands the concepts of tokenization, understands that there's a, a different world of value exchange that we are beginning very much to build. So the future isn't as far as we had feared. Can you give us a sense of where we are and what comes next in that space? Yeah, sure. So basically what, what I see happening is that all different aspects of value is becoming tokenized and created into these fractional shares that are a superior way to digitize value. So if initially the value that got digitized was you know, currency and, and money transfer, because that's a very widely used source of value. Now I think everything um, is gonna become you know, made digital and made tokenized and turned into like fractional shares that have a few unique properties that didn't exist before. One of the properties is you can own smaller and smaller pieces of everything, um, which is useful because then everybody can participate in, in owning various types of value, whether that's real estate value, cash flows from different uh, types of things, art, um, you know, all kinds of different notions of value are gonna become digitized and tokenized in a very fractional, easy to own way. The, the second unique property I think is gonna be control. So historically you've had to rely on institutions to be an intermediary that gives you a way to interact with value. But new technologies, blockchain technologies, basically allow end users to have direct control over uh, a piece of value. Um, and then f institutions kind of facilitate that through applications. And then the final thing is, uh, I would say risk management, because there is a consistently very worrying pattern where value is uh, destroyed when risk is poorly managed. And you see this in like the 2008 financial crisis and recently with SVB and, and a whole bunch of other types of things where if the risk of the value isn't properly accounted for and managed, then it, you know, the value you thought you had isn't the value you have. And so all the information that's gonna go into these tokenized, uh, you know, unique 
separate pieces of value also allows people to know what the risks are of having each of those distinct pieces of value, and so they can manage their risk. Um, so not, I think not only is everything going to become tokenized and made into these fractional shares that people control, but I think you'll also eliminate a lot of systemic uh, risk that uh, puts that uh, value at risk and, and makes that value not work the way people expect, which in, in my view is one of the fundamental problems of, of all the value and all, all the systems here is, you know, there could be days when you thought the value was this much and then there were some decisions made that didn't include you and then the value is something else. And that's a very fundamental problem that I think uh, we're, we're well on the way to solving with blockchains and tokenization, real world assets, Oracle smart contracts, you know, that's, that's what we work on. I, I personally absolutely adore the democratization component of access to value that, that you picked up there. But there are two pieces distinct in what you said that I want us to unpack. The first one, um, I'll come to you guys to respond to, and then if you don't mind, I'll come back to you. But if I, if I unpack what Sergey just said, the first thing um, that stayed with me was that idea of control shifting. And that's where I want to get your guys' reactions. The second is that a lot of what you talked about is um, capability that exists out there. So I want to come back to you in a second and talk about what participation looks like for some of the people in the audience. But first, control. In the world that Sergey described, which is a world that is accessible out there, we're not a few years back when we thought about this possibly not happening in our lifetime, or as my boss back then said, do I need to learn this before I retire? And the answer, of course, was no. Right now, there isn't anyone in this room who can afford to not learn this until they retire. And they can't afford to not understand what it means for their organization. So, Jim, I'll come to you. What Sergey described as a shifting of control is fantastic for me as a user, pretty scary for an institution. So, how do we think through that to adapt our organization's policies? That, that's the holy grail on anything we're talking about because, you know, change sucks. And, and one of the biggest challenges the industry has right now is embracing change and doing things differently. You know, we look at back office modernization and we tend to modernize old processes which doesn't move us forward. So when you're looking at a redefining of control, at the end of the day, the consumers, the businesses, the financial institutions are reining back control because they have the ability to. We, we find that in uh, the consumer marketplace, the retail banking marketplace, consumers are now democratizing and going across different platforms to get their, their problem solved. And financial institutions think they have retained their customer. The reality is they retain an account, but the customer has diversified their relationships because they have the ability to go for something better, to go for something that they value more than they did their old organization. I mean, I, I, I many times will get in an audience and say, how many of you have opened a new account in the last two, five years and nobody raised their hand, a major account, or changed their, their existing banking relationship? Then they ask how many of you have, have opened a brand new relationship, but everybody raised their hands. That's the control factor, because the consumer no longer wants to be dictated to. They want to dictate their choice, which you know the platform and the ability to do that makes it so that we can't, to your point, stand still. We can't continue to look at money as a transactional vehicle as opposed to a, a value exchange, which is much broader definition. Absolutely. So, so Gail, I'm going to come to you as the queen of friction. Gela was the first person I ever heard say that no friction is a bad thing. The, the picture that Sergey painted for us of putting consumers back in control, of allowing higher degrees of participation through a technological enablement. That to me sounds amazing. Am I missing something? I don't think so. I think it's in the framing of it. Who is fundamentally in control? It is the systems that are fundamentally in control. And those who set the systems and process are absolutely in control. But that can, they can enable control, which I would call choice, uh, at the end consumer, be that an organization or an individual or anywhere in between. It fundamentally is how do I offer up a selection of possibilities over which I still have governance and I can still control risk? So part of it is, do I own process, which is the as-the-service component? And if I can provide the service, then I can allow the design on top of that. So think of it in two layers, protocol, 
versus application. The protocol is still owned by the institutions. It is by the financial institutions and system itself. And if we, dict if we design protocol that has guardrails, has risk controls, it has governance, supervision, enforcement, and oversight, that still is control. But if we allow a little bit more dynamism on the application layer, if there's an element of customization, if there's an element of choice that expands the inclusion and democratizes the access, that is still giving control to the end user. Part of it is, for example, the data that they choose to share, the data that they choose to move, the data that they actually provide to enable the end service. That is much more under their control. That is control, but it's also choice. And yet, at the same time, the institutional protocol system layer is firmly governed by a set of rules upon which we all agree. And so there are control mechanisms, there are governance uh, systems in place for that. So it's just a reframing of what sits in protocol and what sits in application. And, and we know that users, decision makers, and regulators have been on the steepest learning curve for a very long time. But again, even though we're saying we're starting a conversation that will last 10 years, a lot of the stuff we're talking about right now is right here, right now. And I'm coming back to you, Sergey, for the second part of that conversation. The, the world that you describe, the, to the world of the ability to tokenize is, um, fractional value, to participate in that value creation and, and value distribution, it is fair to say that not everyone in these hallowed halls is participating. From a practical perspective, if I am an institution with a complex tech estate, um, with all the problems and all the costs associated with that, what does not being left behind look like? Because the fear in, in any decision maker's mind is, do I have to find like a few hundred million and a a whole new team of 700,000 people to work on this. So all, all those decision makers, in my, in my experience, are driven by their clients and their users' demand, right? Because in, in capitalism, your ability to service your users' demand is what determines if you continue to exist. So all of, in, in, in my opinion, it's, it's such a superior way for people to own, control, transmit, and manage the risk around all value that eventually everyone's users will basically demand it as a requirement. So I, I think you know, that's, that's really the first thing. There, there's always really different levels of participation in any technology or technological shift or, or any kind of interfacing with any user base. So for example, in the internet, right? That was a change in how institutions interfaced with people. And even today, there are still uh, different institutions with different degrees of using the internet. Some people have mobile apps, some people don't still have mobile apps, some people have good websites, some people have bad websites, oh, you know, yes. so, on, so on and so on. So I, I think the, um, the, the first difference will be how involved do you want to be in this new way of transmitting, controlling, and managing the risk of, of value. Um, <coughs> the, the simplest answer to that is basic custody. So when clients come to you and they say, I want you to go get that. I want, I want access to Bitcoin, I want access to some coin, a stable coin, whatever. Can you even facilitate that access, that very basic interaction with that other asset? So that's a custody um, solution. That you don't really need to build, you can adopt some, some existing solution. After that point, um, what everyone's going to see and what I, we are, what I already see even here at uh, Cybos is, a bunch of people making their own assets, right? So now you start making your own assets because a lot of the institutions here are very good at making assets and packaging up assets into financial products. In fact, the best people on the whole planet are doing it. So I think uh, the, the people in this conference are going to be the world leaders in packaging assets into tokenized uh, financial products because they've been doing it just not in a blockchain-based way for decades. And then there's going to be a bunch of competition um, and then your decision as a decision maker will be, do I want to participate in the blockchain economy, tokenization, real world assets thing? And it'll be very similar to the internet decision. And if you don't participate in it, it'll be a very big problem. So I, I would say the first answer to your question is yes, you should plan to invest in hundreds of people uh, the way things are going. And then the second part of your answer is, there's technical solutions like the stuff we make at Chainlink and something called CCIP, which is a cross-chain protocol 
that can lower the technical cost of integrating into all of these chains and being able to interact with all these assets. And so there are technical solutions that can reduce the, the cost. But um, I think a lot of the entities and institutions here will, I, I think the whole global financial system will run on blockchains, period. So everyone here is going to be in the blockchain industry eventually. So, I mean, there's no decision, really. It's like a decision of how much do you want to be ahead on that or behind. Which is a scary thought given how much else is happening, but a sober one, and, and I suspect what people come here for. And one of the things I find interesting is that the demographic that attends the Inner Tribe sessions are the people who are the custodians of the decision making for the future. Now, what we're seeing is that what you described, Sergey, I think there are people who. Well, there were people who were nodding very vigorously as you were speaking, and I'm sure there are people who are probably believe you're wrong, but wish the time frame is. Um, I didn't say anything looser. about time frame. No, 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 you did not. <laughs> and there are people that are very hopeful. I didn't you're say wrong, a time right? frame. Um, but in my experience, which is longer than I care to admit in this industry, the thing that has usually catalyzed adoption cycles is where the regulator lands on these things. So as we're staring at this world where the art of the possible is known, the regulator is usually the, the, the force that catalyzes some of these decisions. How, and I'm going to look to you, Gela, given uh, some of the collaborations you lead, what's the learning curve of the regulator like in these discussions that we're having here, where a lot is unknowable and open-ended? It's surprisingly fast. They, I think there's been a fundamental shift in how regulation has approached technology with the understanding that they need to unpack that in order to be much more proactive in their forecasting around how to de-risk the system and how to protect the end outcomes. Interestingly enough, there are a lot of regulators that do massive collaborations across the globe. So we're not looking at just market-specific or state-specific. We're looking at uh, a learning curve that has been accelerated by collaboration for regulators with regulators. Just for example, I was up at 3 this morning to uh, participate in the Global Financial Innovation Network, which is a consortium of uh, regulators across the world to address ESG and greenwashing. And the fact that they have created digital sandbox with synthetic data that will actually test these life solutions, the fact that they're interested in consuming all of the information they possibly can as quickly as they possibly can and having cross cross-departmental conversations about how the innovation program and understanding the technology, the regulatory, the, the supervision, the policy, and the data syntax standards and uh, data science all actually interface, and they're doing this at, at pace. The interesting thing is there are markets that are entirely led by the market and industry, and then there are markets that have to be forced into action by the regulator. And in, we're trying to find a balance probably more tipping towards proactively asking for mandates that demand a particular type of behavior, especially when we're talking about data sharing and the mobility of data, and data being the primary asset or the insight being that, that asset that needs to move that, that concept of value. They are entirely engaged on this and are actually creating the long-term regulatory framework for that data sharing economy, that open data. We've already faced into open banking to a certain extent. Uh, there are some jurisdictions that have leapfrogged into the extension of open finance that goes beyond payment and transactional data. And now we're actually looking at economies that are being built around the intersectionality of multi-sector data sharing, both public data sets that are provided by government and state, as well as private data sets that are primarily custodianed by whichever industry. But the regulators are not sleeping on this. The regulators are absolutely more proactive. And quite frankly, I think that industry will be challenged to keep up with the pace of regulation. We see that in the length of time it takes to deliver certain initiatives that the regulators decided on 10 years ago, but we're, all, we're just seeing come to fruition now. But everything is going to adapt to the need to scale at speed. And the speed is the component that we're actually facing into now. So it is a matter of the fact that everything else around us is much, moving much more quickly. And how is the financial industry choosing to engage on the question of speed, delivery, and time? And the speed piece is something I want to stay with before we move to the, the next piece that we can't 
close without addressing, which is CBDCs. But I want to I wanna stay with speed for a second, because if I look back at the last 15 years, we have had to deal with a lot of new technology, a lot of new shapes of ways of working, a lot of new ways of thinking, and we've done okay, B minus, right? We have adopted eventually, but we haven't taken the fastest route or the most economical route, the most <coughs> sensible route as an industry. Um, most of the time, there has been resistance in the process, either notional, uh, sort of conscious or not. And the reality is that has been difficult. And now what we're seeing is that after this difficult journey, we don't get to pause. There is a lot more coming, a lot faster. But the, the sense of fatigue inside organizations is very real. So I'm going to turn to you, Jim, on the human side. It's the same people who got the B minus, largely, mm -hmm. who need to face into all of what we're talking about in an accelerated time frame. How do we deal with that organizationally? If we're going to be having this discussion for 10 years, we yeah. need our people to last the course. Well, it's interesting because based on what you just said, I will challenge the fact that the regulators are moving at speed and we have to catch up with the regulators. My personal experience is that we're, the banking industry is using regulation as an excuse not to move forward at speed and scale. And, and I'm challenging that because I believe that in a lot of things that are going on right now, financial institutions are looking for permission and looking for the regulators to be ahead of the curve. And in some cases, they are. But Jim, in a lot of cases, I don't believe they are. Jim, maybe it's market specific. Oh, because it, oh to totally. But, it's, but I, North America, for sure. Oh, it's behind the curve. But I don't live in North America. Right. And I look at the rest of the world. So I'm saying it's market specific. I would say the UK is very similar. But maybe not. OK, so to that point, we still have to change ourselves. You know, so the, the re end of the day, the, the ability to change at speed, to change at all what we're doing, is a human aspect. Because one thing that can be universally agreed to is that everybody in this room, everybody in our organizations, are fearful of the change that's coming on because digitalization in their mind replaces their life, replaces their job. Generative AI replaces their job. What we have to do is actually build cultures that are embracing the change that it's had and the humanization of that process. I would say one of the biggest concepts of value that we've talked before is really the humanization of that experience that is not something that can be simply transacted in a, in a digital way. Either way, whoever's leading the process, we have to move faster because, you know, I, I use the saying, change has never happened this fast, it'll never happen this slowly again. Playing catch-up sucks every, every moment we're sitting on this stage and we're not moving forward. So the, your very first question was, what do we do Monday? If we wait till Tuesday, we've lost the day we won't get back. And, and it's important because we need to embrace concepts of value that we can take action on. And maybe in many cases are already going down that path. So what we have to do is, number one, we have to communicate. We have to have transparency internally. We have to in, have inclusionary. We have to have democratization of data and insights in every area of the bank, not just retail or corporate or anything like that, but across the whole ecosystem, including our customers, because they're, they're behind the curve from the standpoint of knowing where we are. I, I, I use the example that my financial institutions, if I got into their back office, probably know more about me than I want to. They just never show that they know about me and take action based on that. They probably don't realize how much they know oh, about it's, you. Yes, exactly. So I think, you know, it's probably the most important component because it's the part that can hold us back. Agreed? Okay. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> you can stay behind, oh, and well. while I'm signing right. my books, they'll have a little fist fight. Um, I think there is, there is tension there, and a lot of this is market-specific, but I think we can't argue that... The regulators are on this learning curve at different speeds. I must admit, I see a lot of markets that are more nudged than the regulators than not. Um, the, the organizations that are trying to face into the change have data that they don't quite harvest. And I, I have been told that I'm a cynic in the past when I say I don't want to hear about your generative AI efforts until you switch off your Oracle mainframes, right? Yeah. Uh, but I am the person <laughs> who manages to talk about mainframes on every panel this week, and I'm very proud of that. But the reality is, that every single banking institution out there still has a mainframe that's older than me somewhere. And we're trying to cope with the pace of change and everything that's coming down the pipe, which is not just technologically a challenge, but it's also intellectually a challenge, because the world that Sergey is painting 
can't be serviced by what we have. So to participate in the new paradigm, we can't carry the legacy we have with us. And of course, we can't have this conversation without actually talking about CBDCs. And the thing that I want to get to first is that everyone is talking about CBDCs as a thing apart. But the whole point is they won't be a thing apart until they come out of the lab. So over to you, Sergey. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I've, I've been speaking with a number of central, uh, central banks um, all, all over the world, actually. And I, I really see two models. So one model is where the central bank um, acts as a basically a, a settlement system across the, the different banks. Uh, and it only interacts with a few large players. And in that world, it's not even really clear that you need a uh, blockchain, and it's not very clear that there's anything that actually changed, basically. So you basically just made a unit of account that works between you and your 15 or 10 biggest banks in your country to interact with your central bank. And there's fundamentally no trust issue there. So you don't really need new technology. You can just write it on a clay tablet. You can just you can write it on a napkin. You owe me this. And it, it doesn't matter, right? Because no one's going to double spend the central bank and nothing, you know, like it's, it's, it's a huge trust relationship. If you don't trust your bank enough to take the central bank enough to take their claims on a clay tablet, you have like way bigger problems. So, so that's one model. And then the second model, uh, the more technically complex one, is the one where CBDCs get pumped out across, you know, an entire population. So their blockchains and all these types of t new technologies, I think, are very useful because it solves a lot of coordination problems. And that's a world where you know, there's a blockchain per country, and then everyone is uh, getting their central bank um, approved currency on, on that chain. Um, in, in the first model, by the way, there, there's actually many, many private stable coins. Right? So in the, in the first model, the central bank doesn't want to make stable coins. They settle with a few big banking entities, and you basically end up in a world with every single bank having its own stable coin backed by their um, repo but where their reserves with the C central bank. And then in that world, you have a multitude of different bank stable coins all being used to, to represent the same uh, country currency. In, in the second model, you don't have a multitude of different bank stable coins. You have a single uh, governmentally mandated um, fiat uh, tokenized digital currency. Uh, the thing that I actually th think will think happen is um, you, you might end up having both. Um, so there's this interesting idea of like an additional money supply that you can give to retail users to stimulate the economy. Um, there's some really good research on this from one of the really smart guys at the, the, the Bank of London, where basically you make a new money supply. And that new money supply is just for retail, and it stimulates a lot of economic activity. So you could do that. And you could get a whole bunch of stable coins generated by a bunch of banks. Um, both of those things, I think, are, are very viable. I, I think the idea of controlling people more through CBDCs is something that's going to be increasingly known to people and something they'll find unattractive. So I think, I think that aspect is something that um, I don't think people will, will necessarily get behind. I'm glad you mentioned that, because that's my biggest bugbear and the thing that I lose sleep over the most. But I have a follow-up question for, for 10 points for me, Sergey, if you don't mind. You raised some very important questions that we do, do not expect to have solved by now around the optionality for the global architecture, of the, the sort of end game that we're going towards. Um, and I'm going to leave the sort of citizenship and liberty piece out of it. You gave some options of the future. Where is that joined up thinking being done, if anywhere? So each uh, central bank has its own interests and its own political dynamics. And central banks are very heavily tied to the political interests of their, uh, well, political systems. Um, what I've seen, so, so let, you know, I've seen some central banks that they want to stimulate their local economy. Um, so making like uh, an additional money supply purely for retail to stimulate economic activity is, uh, is something they're interested in. I've seen them think about things like let's make that money supply only usable for certain specific things that we want to stimulate only those things. And so, you know, it starts to take on this like universal basic income type of quality, which is, which is a little strange. 
um, and, and may or may not work because there's a bunch of structural issues with, with making that work. The other thing that I've seen a lot is more globalization, right? Let's, let's do more foreign direct investment into our country. Let's, let's make our um, central bank digital currency a very easily accessible, easy to acquire way for more foreign direct investment to flow into our economy, right? And, and globalization as a force has gotten us to, to where we are as, a, as a, you know, both as individual societies and as highly connected societies. It's a, probably the most powerful. I don't think technology has been the most powerful. I think globalization, powered by technology, has been the most powerful force. Well, you know, we all wear clothes and eat food and use technology from all different places, right? So it's kind of nuts when you think about it in a historical context. And, and so I think because globalization has had a big impact on certain countries and, and made them come up, um, they are seeking to continue that. And so I think, central, I think those countries are focused on that. And then there are a bunch of countries that don't know what they want to do, and they're kind of in exploratory mode. But I, I think they'll end up in one of those two worlds. Either I want to stimulate my local economy or I want FDI, probably both. Um, most of the ones I've spoken to offline is a probably both territory. But I think what is implicit in all of this is a, is a shifting definition of the role of the central bank. So again, you, you have become the voice of the regulator in this one, Gela. Sorry about that. Um, I must admit that in the, in the conversations I have had with central banks, the momentous, of the, the momentous choice of what am I to the economy and is it changing isn't always understood. And to resolve some of the joined up thinking questions that Sergey just painted, we need some intentional participation from these central banks. What are you seeing? I'm seeing the struggle between, between remaining agnostic and the fiat currency is a representation of agnosticism. And then looking at the CBDC as a potential reworking of the social contract and the normative values for the social, the social state. And how does that actually interplay across the geopolitical landscape? So there are conflicting, uh, there are conflicting tensions between remaining agnostic, understanding what we have previously agreed to as a global economy, let alone a local economy, and then having the ability to quote unquote program the value principles from a social contract perspective, a behavioral perspective. Money as we know it, fiat currency, doesn't necessarily drive behavior. It's an expression of behavior. And it's that shift to accepting that this is behavior versus how do I actually then start to influence behavior. And that seems to be it. How do I remain agnostic in a world of nudges and influence and reframing? And given the fact that there is absolute unrest across multiple areas of the world, multiple social overlapping Venn diagrams of the world. How do you, as a central bank then, relate that relationship of that tension in the global economy amongst states, let alone in your local, local economy itself? They don't know where they can sit and they don't know how to keep it hygienic. So a lot of them that I, that I get the feedback from is it's actually a little bit too early because we don't know. We have, there are too many unknowns, there are too many factors that are up for debate. And again, it's actually an interesting representation of value because it is a value discussion, not the asset, but the principle. Sorry. So I think it's, there's, we're still too early in terms of the policy decisions or the direction of travel for that, but the tension is very much recognized and agnosticism is still a, a driving, a driving framework for how they, they sort of touch it. In, in some ways, the fact that everything we're talking about is here but not fully formed means that we've started our next 10 peer dialogue in the right place. As we're coming to a close of this first session, Jim, I'm going to give you the hardest question of all. What do you think will be top of mind when we get together here next year? <laughs> well, I hope it's future value as opposed to future money. I, I think it's going to be, to your very first point, it's going to be, how are we implementing this? How are we going down that path? And how are we answering multiple constituencies? How do you, how do you answer to the regulators? How do you answer to the consumer? How do you answer to each other within an a, a entity like this where you have organizations working together towards a common goal? I, I think it's going to be a matter of prioritization. We, in our pre-talk, I think it really gets down to this is bigger than future money was. So how do you prioritize where you start and where you start to make an impact. So I think next year at this time, we're gonna see some organizations are starting to, they already are starting to embrace 
the future value versus the transactional concept of money. I think we're going to see a lot more in, in your, Sergey's your space in what's going on, and certainly a lot in the, in the regulatory space because they've, they're getting their hands around what's going on. But I, I think at the end of the day, how we proceed is going to be where do we prioritize and how are we prioritizing? I'm going to say making it so that the, the entity of time becomes so important. So how do we make everything we're doing simpler so it can move faster? How do we keep up with the pace of demand on what consumers and organizations, financial institutions are demanding? Because we're right now having a, a challenge of that. And how are we expanding our minds beyond the transactional elements of, of value to embrace things like sustainability, um, embracing things like equity and equality. You know, those are, those are concepts that we're just scratching the surface of. I'm hoping that next year we have people up here that are actually implementing against this and are showing tangible value. We talked about an organization that I'm familiar with that is a credit union that basically gives back every bit of what they're doing back to their members because they have no branches. They have a very high efficiency ratio. How do you build value in that kind of environment? And how do you compete against an organization that can actually do business in a way that you continually are giving it all back to the users? I think it's fair to say that across the topics we discussed, and there were many that we didn't even get around to, everything is in motion, not fully formed, and there's a whole host of decisions that are yet to be made, and some of those decisions are to be made inside your organizations in terms of allocation of time, resource, and headspace. Some will be made across and between organizations, and some will be made with wider ecosystems, communities, and regulators. None of the things we talked about are far, though. And I think one of the things that is interesting is that we will be seeing that pace pick up. I am pretty sure that some of the questions that are still undefined will be much more concrete next year. In so many ways, we get together to learn and, and, and instigate thinking. Um, I hope that the panelists we have had here with us have done exactly that. But I think it's also fair to say that there is a lot. And it's exhausting. And it's confusing. And there is a lot to be learned. So before we part, I want to go back to what Sergey said about um, accepting the inevitability of certain things and deciding to double down on them. If, uh, if, they, um, if this week is anything uh, to go by, the right people are here, so find those partners. Um, if uh, the fatigue of doing the work is uh, tearing you down, Ines has kindly gotten copies of my book for all of you, so grab one on the way off. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for being part of this new cycle of conversations that hopefully will be bringing us together for a very long time to come. And if you are part of this dialogue and part of this community, then the one thing we ask of you is to hold us accountable. If the conversation is not progressing, then we're doing it wrong. Thank you for your time.